we can learn more about Mexican wolves and what we can do to save them. Uh, in reference to my uh, the title of my talk, I admit that the title might be a bit aspirational, but ecological enlightenment is a goal that we must pursue. I think if we fail to achieve general ecological awareness, especially among our leaders, we will fail to stem the sixth mass extinction of life on Earth. The photograph depicts the actual site where the famous early 20th century conservation thinker Aldo Leopold fired the shots in 1909 killing the wolf that ultimately changed his views on the role of wolves in their ecosystems. Years later in his famous essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, Leopold wrote these words. He said, I now suspect that as a deer herd lives in mortal fear of its wolves, so does a mountain live in mortal fear of its deer, and perhaps with better cause. For a while a buck pulled down by wolves can be replaced in two or three years. A range pulled down by too many deer may fail of replacement in as many decades. While the role of wolves in their ecosystems are now well, more, uh, more understood scientifically. The task of restoring wolves to their former ha habitats is fraught with obstacles and pitfalls. These are mostly political. The science is pretty clear. With the passage of the Endangered Species Act in 1973, uh, that act saved Mexican gray wolves from pretty much certain extinction. Exterminated in the U.S. Southwest by the 1940s, they were placed on the list of endangered species in 1976, when only a few still roam the wilds down in Mexico. These are the wolves that were trapped by Roy McBride that Gene was talking about. The primary purposes of the Endangered Species Act are to provide a means whereby the ecosystems upon which endangered and threatened species depend may be conserved and to provide a program for the conservation of endangered and threatened species. The Endangered Species Act defines conservation to mean what now is usually referred to as recovery. Nearly 50 years ago, Congress clearly understood the linkage between ecosystem health and ecosystem protection and species survival but the Fish and Wildlife Service has not yet fully embraced this concept of linking the two concepts together. Few people realize that the Endangered Species Act is both an ecosystem protection act and a species protection act. Following its listing as an endangered species in 1976, the live capture of the five lobos of Mexico in the late 70s began a captive breed program, which was started in 1980. A recovery plan was written and adopted in 1982, but little progress toward implementing recovery action was made by the Fish and Wildlife Service from 1982 to 1990. Beyond its ecosystem and species protection mandates, probably the next most significant provision in the Endangered Species Act is found in the little known section 11G. That section provides for citizen suits. The section authorizes any person to commence a civil suit on his or her own behalf following a 60 day notice of intent to sue. And importantly, it authorizes the federal courts to award the costs of litigation to the pervading parties in court. Over the decades, this provision has proved to be critically important for ensuring that the federal agencies carry out their duties under the legal mandates of the Endangered Species Act. Indeed, uh, no significant step forward toward Mexican wolf recovery has occurred without citizen-initiated litigation to force the Fish and Wildlife Service to comply with the requirements of the Endangered Species Act. The first such civil litigation was filed by the Wolf Action Group on Earth Day in 1990 to force the Fish and Wildlife Service to implement 
the 1982 recovery plan and begin the process of reintroducing captive Mexican wolves into the wild. Part of the settlement agreement compelled the Fish and Wildlife Service to hire a biologist whose sole responsibility would be to plan for and implement recovery actions for the critically endangered Mexican wolf. The position carried the title of Mexican Wolf Recovery Coordinator, and I was selected to fill that position in October of 1990. Many lawsuits have been filed since then to force forward progress toward full recovery of Mexican wolves. The current opportunity to improve the management rules for the wild population arises from a favorable court ruling in March of 2018. The court found that in its promulgating of the 2015 management rule, that the Fish and Wildlife Service failed to apply the best science and the provisions of the rule failed to ensure the recovery of Mexican wolves as is required under Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act. Court ordered the Fish and Wildlife Service to remedy several deficiencies in the rule by May of 2021, which creates the opportunity we're talking about here today. But stepping back about 22 years, we were nearing the end of the Clinton administration and the Secretary of Interior, Bruce Babbitt, was on a path to make wolf recovery one of his legacy achievements. Three years earlier, he carried the first crate of Northern Gray Wolves to a release pen in Yellowstone National Park. And we all know how successful the Yellowstone releases were. Could I have the next slide, please, Amy? This photo depicts the ceremonial aspect of the initial releases of Mexican wolves in the Southwest. Speaking from personal experience, these formal events with high level government officials are a program manager's worst nightmare. The wolf team got about three hours of sleep the night before and we were all crammed into a single room in the Hannigan Meadow Lodge in the middle of the Apache National Forest. The whole event was tightly planned and scripted National media showed up in droves and parked their vans on the paved highway with their satellite dishes near the road to the release bin. Anti-wolf locals were staging a protest in the nearby village, Valpine, Arizona. Heavy snow required the use of snow cats to transport both dignitaries and wolves down the forest road for about two miles to the pen near the Campbell Blue River. On the front corner of the first crate is the Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt. On the right corner is Jamie Clark, who was then the Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. On the back left corner is Trish Stevenson. She's a granddaughter of Aldo Leopold and the daughter of Nina Leopold. And out of view on the back right corner is Dwayne Shrove, who was then the Director of the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And escorting them all is a much younger and less gray version of me. And out of view to the left of Secretary Babbitt is my Arizona Game and Fish Department counterpart, Terry Johnson. It was Super Bowl Sunday, 1998, and the Broncos beat the Packers 31 to 24. We weren't watching the game, of course, no, nor did we give a damn who won we had a much more important mission to accomplish. Two months later on March 29th, project biologists quietly opened the back gates to the three pens housing 11 lobos at dusk and the wolves self-released in the night as heavy snow was falling. The lobos of the Southwest were back home after nearly a half century of absence. Another 115 Mexican wolves from the captive breeding pool have been released since. And the last official count at the end of 2019 estimated 163 wolves in the wild population. But the numbers can be deceiving. The genetic health of the population is dismal and it's declining over time by every measure you can take of genetic diversity. The chart, this chart shows the inbreeding coefficient of the wild population. 
how related are the wolves is what it's showing. And that coefficient currently in 2018 was 0.22. The easiest way to obtain that level of inbreeding is for your mother and father to be brother and sister. In that case, your inbreeding coefficient would be 0 0.25. And you can see that steep decline in the curve. So it may well be 0 0.25 by now, but we haven't seen those numbers yet. When we put, <clears throat> put this situation in these terms, I think everyone can understand that the genetic situation is pretty dire. But it even gets worse when we look at gene diversity. The chart in the lower left corner shows the gene diversity in the Mexican walls. The way to view these graphs, graphs is to visualize them as teeth in a comb. And the missing teeth represent gene locations on a chromosome that are fixed for only one variant of the gene at that location. Most genes come in several variants that can occupy a given gene location. For example, genes that determine eye color in humans. When the blue-eyed gene is the only form of the eye color gene left in the entire human population, everyone will have blue eyes. You might remember from your high school biology class that you get one copy of a gene from each of your parents. Gene diversity is what makes everyone different. And it's what makes evolution possible. Natural selection can't operate without a selection of genes to choose from. Everywhere the comb's teeth are missing, there's only one form of that gene left in the population, and all other variants have been permanently lost from the overall Mexican wolf genome. For Mexican wolves, this began with the severe bottlenecking of the subspecies to just seven founders prior to 1980. Further decline of gene diversity in captive populations is inevitable over time. And that has happened in the Mexican wolf population. And that's why genetic scientists tell us that it's important to act quickly to move the captured gene diversity from the captive population out into the wild as soon as possible. And we have to do that because we, you know, species recovery really only occurs in the wild. It's not really recovery if you just have them in zoos. While we began, we began with seven founders, the gene diversity has already declined to the equivalent of only three founders in the captive population and only two founders in the wild population. That explains that high inbreeding coefficient. To put it bluntly, the Fish and Wildlife Service has failed miserably in managing the gene pool and the transfer of gene diversity in the captive population to the wild population. Note that the number of monomorphic or fixed loci, the missing teeth in the comb, <clears throat> in this sample, uh, or in the Mexican wolves, is uh, much greater than any other wolf population in this sample, including the severely bottlenecked Isle Royale, Michigan population in the lower right-hand corner, which recently became functionally extinct. There were only two wolves left, and it was rescued with the introduction of, of new founders from the mainland population of Minnesota. The significant lack of gene diversity in Mexican wolves limits their ability to evolve and to adapt to changing environmental conditions. As for example, the effects of climate change or uh, emerging diseases. These missing Mexican wolf gene variants are lost to the population can, and can only be restored through the addition of new founders, which are not known to exist within the Mexican gray wolf subspecies. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's bungling of genetic management of the wild Mexican wolf population was not overlooked by the federal judge. In her court order, the judge stated, by failing to provide for the population's genetic health, the Fish and Wildlife Service has actively imperiled the long-term viability of the species in the wild. Those are really strong words from a federal judge. 
Expedited genetic rescue is needed to prevent extinction of the lobos of the Southwest. If we let it happen again this time, it's going to be forever. Thanks to the citizen supervision of the Endangered Species Act, we get another chance to advise the Fish and Wildlife Service on how to get it right this time. Thank you very much. I think we're probably going to question and answers at this point. I'll turn it back to Amy. Thanks so much, Dave. It's, it's so great to get that background and um, history, particularly directly from you. Um, before we jump into questions, I just want to thank you again.